Welcome to the Orthopedic Indications channel, where we discuss medical education for medical sales consultants and reps. Um, and Bethany, this one's yours as well. Um, and uh, I just want to show it because, you know, in the, uh, as we 3D printing has become so much more popular, I want to kind of like highlight some other options that you can use as well. So if you ever get into some of these cases, uh, some tricks you might have. So this is, this is gentleman is in his twenties, I believe, I believe he's late twenties and comes in as a motor vehicle accident. So this is going to be a quick summary, uh, which involved years of work basically. Um, so this is the involved extremity that we're going to talk about. This is his left ankle. So, you know, obviously a very severe ankle fracture, Taylor, body fracture. You can tell that this probably is open and this is his other side. So calcaneus, talus, all look bad. And just a quick couple of views. You can see this is the left side, I believe. And you can see that, um, you know, that body of the talus looks crushed, absolutely crushed. And so Bethany, I believe initially he got X fixed, provisional fixation, intramedullary screw to stabilize his fibula, a couple K wires to hold those pieces in place, the whatever kind of had some, some bone left to it. But obviously this isn't going well and uh, kept in an X fix for a while. And then it sounds like at about two months after the injury, you came back and you did a cement spacer. Sorry, these images are kind of crummy. Wait came back to try to fix it and we opened it up and pus came out. Okay. So okay. we washed it and put the cement spacer in there. And I just, I thought this was good because one is like, keep this in mind. If you ever get into the OR and there's, and this is a good bailout. You know, if you get into something where there's a bunch of bone loss and you don't have the right equipment or there's infection, like thinking through your head, like what options do I have to kind of like bail out? Cement spacer with antibiotics is a really good space, is a really good option. It's ubiquitous. You're going to have it in every hospital. So it's something that I think can be used. And sometimes we kind of forget about that as an option. So something you could suggest to your, um, to your surgeons as if they get into a situation that they may need a bailout. Hey, what about a cement spacer? Because it gives stability. It, you know, it, it, in this case, you're doing, we're thinking fusion, right? So it gives you kind of maybe this masculine effect to it. Um, as well. So a good bailout that sometimes I think we forget about. All right. Meanwhile, on the right, you know, he's got, now he's got a fine wire on the right. I think he had some soft tissue issues on the right side as well uh, with a, um, I think he involved some plastics work or something there. And that one's, you know, a whole other story, which I'll show the finals at the end. Oh, oh God. <laughs> All right. So in summary, we've got a young person, catastrophic injuries, the lower extremities, AVN of the talus, bone loss. And then on the right, on the, um, that's on the left, the one we're going to talk about is the left. So AVN of the talus and bone loss on the right side, he's got, you know, severe soft tissue injury. So Bethany, how, tell, talk us through like your thoughts on like fusing this guy, preserving bone stock and, and how you approached it. Well, I, when we went in the second time, it, it looked like his Taylor neck was healed. Um, and so we really had this like Taylor body bone loss. And I didn't um, want to use a bulk allograft I, I, if I didn't have to because of the setting of infection on that side. Um, so we did a blare, which is uh, where you take the top, the, take the tibia and you take the front of the tibia and you slide it down and dock it into the talus. Um, or into the calcaneus, depending on what you're trying to do with it, and put a plate on and get it to heal that way. And so, uh, just it, Kate. So what she's saying is like this here. This is that that front of the tib tibia here that she did a corticotomy, and then she slid it distal down into this area to kind of make up to take up that bone space right there. So when when you're doing that, you have this uh, the the posterior part kind of provisionally fixed with these. Uh, as diamond pins i did because he had the he did have media or lateral talus he did have a portion of talus that we were able to use and put up into the tibia onto the tibia and get the alignment that we needed and then fill the void yeah and then this provides some blood supply right into that area to kind of help provide yeah. more structural healthy, and healthy some healthy bone structural healthy bone. piece autograph so it's his own and 
it's kind of an older tech older probably not used really often technique but um can be successful yeah for sure it's a good option to use i mean it's not talked about that often but i think it's a nice option in these really bad um cases of avn you know you have a young patient i mean you think about your options are pretty limited I know that 3D printing is all the rage and like that's very popular, but I'd be a little bit worried about the setting of infection, the longevity, you know, something like that. I think this is actually a pretty good option. Uh, so you use an anterior, so you use crossing screws, a couple of screws for the post, kind of that was a post, you said posterior medial, no posterior lateral sure. body that you kind of stabilize. And then just plate across the front. Yep. And then what plate is that? You know, Same one. Same one, that dog bone plate that you don't have anymore? Yeah. And then uh, had a little bit of residual varus, so added an osteotomy uh, in the calcaneus to pull them over and a little bit of valgus, looks like. Yeah. But that's, I think, a really nice bailout. You can see here, tibio taylor joint looks healed. You can see, you know, that looks nice and solid. Certainly an increased risk of developing some subtalar arthritis, but I think by doing the osteotomy, you've kind of decompressed that area a little bit. I think will be a, that's a good option for him in a bad, bad injury. Cause you know, you look at your other side and, um, that, that's where he's at now, which I think we did that together. Um, I remember we right. might, yeah, we might've, All right. Maybe harvested bone graft or something for it, but, but that's a yeah, good salvage. His was tricky. Cause you have to, I think for him, it was hard cause you have to work hard to save both sides because you don't know which one you might have to lose if there's right. a really catastrophic problem. Yep. Right. Yeah. These are, these are always tricky. So I think, you know, the, the take homes are, uh, I think from us, the, the committee consensus is to save the fibula if at all possible, uh, <laughs> try to get the alignment. You get a shirt to save the fibula and save the subtalar joint. Okay. Yeah. And we have no end caps. That's the other, our other shirt too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, I can we even can, start a we store. Open up an Amazon store now. That's I right. Think. I'm going to get some merch. All right. Well, I think, I think that's, uh, you know, that's about an hour there of talking through uh, ankle fusions. If you have questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, I think we covered everything. Elliot's an end cap fan. Uh, we'll make fun of him later. Uh, and, uh, I think we covered everything in terms of the questions. I did see one question about, um, oh, what was it that I wanted to touch on? Uh, amniotic membrane products for superficial closure. Anybody using anything like that to help with the closure? I know I've heard people talk about that with total ankles. Um, anybody... I know some people may hate me for saying this, but I, I think there's no data on that whatsoever. I'm, I'm kind of, we, you sound we jaded. No yeah, I'm I'm very jaded regarding uh, <laughs> regarding that stuff. I mean, there's there's no there's no regulation on it, so you don't know what you're getting too. So I, I just have a, you know, and it's it's expensive. So mm -hmm. you know, until someone can say, yeah, this works and so forth. I think there's some like you know, if you could add some stem cells to it, makes sense for healing it. So conceptually, I get it, but I think many of the products here, unless they were proven, and you know, regulated in, in, you know, the same type of dosing in each of those products, then I mean, I'm not, I'm not ready to try it myself. I think one of the things that questions I have, you know, certainly think that the basic science is behind it, but you know, what happens in the, like in the body, you know, like in the real life situation, does those cells or whatever, you know, the products stay in that area or do they kind of leak out into every, everywhere else? That's one of the struggles I've had with it um, yeah. in terms of, you know, same thing around, you know, putting it around tendons and stuff like what stays, what goes, like, how do you know it stays or not? Um, so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, hopefully there's more stuff comes out to help promote tissue healing. I think we, we all, we all have those patients that are difficult, but yeah, uh, I, it is a little bit difficult sometimes. I'm on the biologic committee at our hospital system. And the, in the last six years, there's been a, like a multiple of you know, millions of dollars more spent now on biologics than six years ago. Wow. And I don't know if we've seen results that have matched that increase. Yeah. And like millions of dollars, multiple of millions of dollars at our, in our system. So when you're doing like your autograph harvesting, are you, since we're talking about biologics, then we can talk about autograph. Are you using a system or are you just going up and curating it out? 
usually I'm like thing to like punch it out and yeah I've done both I've done the thing that like the <laughs> trefine yeah thing. The I've auger used that kind of thing yeah but what I've used what I think is the most um for me the most efficient is I use a uh so somehow either I make a bot like a, a window to open up like the proximal tibia um or one of those trefine things and then I take a a, a it's like a medium pituitary so it's not really a really small one. It's like a medium sized one. And I start grabbing bone from inside the tibia. Yeah. And it's, it actually saves my hand because um, instead of using curettes and everything, um, and you had to just have a lot of control over it. And I can, I can harvest bone graft very fast. If they have just the right amount of osteopenia, just the right, you can get a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think some of those things that there's a couple of different devices now, like they have like yeah. the, not Rhea, I mean, Rhea is for, you know, big, don't big bone defects, but I, um, I forgot who makes it right now. They bought, they got bought out by Zimmer. Zimmer, Zimmer bought them. Yeah. That suction? It's like a uh, suction. Yeah. And that kind of yep. makes sense to me. Yeah. It, it, thing. Um, Abbott. You know, it's like a mini Rhea. That's what I look yeah. at as a mini it's Rhea. The, oh, shoot. Somebody's going to put it in the chat for us, I hope. Yeah. Avitus. Avitus. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I don't know how expensive that is per case, you know, but it, it does make sense to me to like, you know, because I think you can harvest bone graft pretty quickly with it. I, that's at least that's what my understanding of it. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the selling point anyway. So, well, thanks everybody for jumping on. Uh, let's see. Will you harvest bone graft even if bone quality isn't great? Wouldn't you want a product with a guarantee of osteogenic growth factors? Yes. I think we talked a little bit about that, that sometimes if we have an older patient on immunosuppression or some of those medications, we will actually may lean us towards yeah. you know something with more osteogenic uh, properties uh, to help kind of, you know, circumvent that sometimes i'll add that to my autograft as well uh, in those cases but I, I, one other question when it comes to graft bethany and um jan do you have an algorithm like and like hey somebody over this age i'm going to use this or no. you know i mean is it just kind of case by case basis case by case basis and I, a lot of times i base it off the rep like if they if they're carrying something and they're in the room because i i don't I mean, there, there's not, but I don't, there, there, and I doubt there will ever be like head to head studies regarding a lot of these bone graft substitutes or allografts. I think they all work to a certain extent. Um, so I'm, I'm not like sold on one of them versus another. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. I guess Lindsay had a question. Do you ever see stress fractures? So, Lindsay, I haven't, knock on wood. Usually um, they get I'm worked not. up for tumor. Is what happens. Yeah. They get That's seen by somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, but I've had one of my partners took so much bone graft. He takes a lot um, for some of his non unions and that he, the patient fractured the tibia like, you know, very soon afterwards. And we had to plate the tibia. Hmm. So. That's too bad. That yeah. That's a lot of bone graft. Yeah, no, he does. I mean, it's it's amazing how much he can get out. <laughs> it's it's a little scary. Yeah. Wow. Is that with or without the cartilage in the video? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. He makes me feel uncomfortable when he shows it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>